Okay, well, we covered a lot of ground, as, dear, as George mentioned early on here. That there, we went through a lot of the law, um, and it's great with this technology that we have the ability to go back and listen to it again, because I listened to last week's again, um, just because there is so much in there um, that I thought it was really life-giving, just to set a foundation of, okay, if, we're fr if we have this freedom from the law, then we need to kind of first set the boundaries and the parameters of what the law really is and to get a really uh of course we want a biblical foundation of what the law is however it's just the new testament in christ revealed so much about the law that we really have to go to the new testament to understand the full impact of what the law was and what its purpose was and really all we identified last week was what the law is and then the purpose in the giving of the law and we'll just kind of just review that again. Of course, we know we talked that the law is just abbreviation, of course, for the law of Moses, all those commandments that were given to Moses when all the Israelites and Moses reached uh, Mount Sinai. And without going into the whole story again, instead of going up and meeting God on the mountain and having a relationship, um, they were afraid. And they said, no, you can be our mediator, Moses. You, you intermediate between us. And so instead, what God gave them was was this code of ethics um and, and within this law of moses we kind of broke it down to three sections um the one on the left was of course um just to to acknowledge that there is only one god one god yahweh or jehovah and there are no other gods besides him and he's monotheistic he's one god not a plurality of gods or multiple gods um, or a pantheon of gods he's one god and so the law helped point people to keep them to the right God. And then <clears throat> I'll, I'll mention why there's an X over that in a minute. But then the second one was we also saw there is these physical rituals. Um, I just learned that in the early church, some, sometimes this was, was um, regarded or, or called the second legislation, which was all these things that came after Exodus 20, after the Ten Commandments. Um, but there, the Ten Commandments um, is only just a small portion. There's 613, possibly, as many of those, maybe more, laws, but there's also these laws about keeping the Sabbath and making sure you have the right clothes because you can't wear cotton and linen. You can only wear one, one type of clothing. You can only plant certain uh, seeds in one row. Um, you know, if you're son rebels and he turns to be a grown-up and he just won't respond to you, take him to the elders and, and the, the elders are judge him and stone him. There's all these crazy laws um, that also and don't eat pork, right? Um, so these were also contained in the law of Moses. But the third set, really, what we found was 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 kind of centering back on the Ten Commandments, which was these morals, which was the, the, the righteousness of God, walking in love with one another, which was the simple stuff of, hey, it's, it's life-giving and good not to murder. It's life-giving and good not to lie. It's life-giving and good to obey your parents. It's life-giving and good to obey the one true God. It's life-giving and good not to steal. So we see that, that there's this righteousness of God contained in the law. And we really focused on in the New Testament. That's really the majority of the time um, when we're, we're, we're talking about when the, when, the, when the New Testament says the law is good, that the law is holy, um, we're, that's the part of the law that it's talking about really concerning the, the, this righteousness of the law. Because we see as a review here, the, the law reflects God's life-giving and loving kindness. We, we see this uh, in, in the different scriptures we looked at, that we should delight in the law of God. We should meditate on it day and night, Psalm 1 says. Deuteronomy says, do what's in the law, because if you do it, you're going to be able to live and you'll be righteous. Proverbs 6 says, in the law is the light in the way of life. So we came to the conclusion that the New Testament says, hey, you know, even though there's a freedom from the law, however, the law is good. In fact, it's really good because it's intended to be life-giving and life-preserving. Not stealing from your neighbor, that's going to save your life because he's not going to come back at you for revenge. <laughs> it's really good not to murder somebody because then you're you are, you are being a life giver instead of taking life. But the problem was, albeit all the, the, light, the, the law is good, it's only good in principle. It's not good when we try and act, actually practice it out. Because we have the sin problem. 
we have the sin problem and God gives us the law and then we somehow, we turned it upside down and said, oh, well, maybe if we, if we just know what to do, just, just tell us what to do, God, and we'll just do it because we can fix this ourselves. We've got this um, Riveter Rosy picture of our minds. We, we've got all the power within our human being or human nature to just do what the law says to do. We can do it. But no, we find the, the New Testament says that's the exact opposite. The purpose of the law when God gave the law to the Israelites wasn't so that now they can do what God wants them to do. It was to show them that specifically they have no power to do what's in the law. And that seems so contrary. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of go on and give an analogy in another slide here. But in our fourth slide of review here, uh, we looked at Galatians 3 particularly. Um, and it says, the Apostle Paul says, the law was given because of transgressions, because of sins, until Jesus came. And there's this intermediary per, a period of time between when uh, human beings had this sinful problem and God gives Abraham this call, hey, all nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. And through your descendant, Isaac, um, the whole world is going to be blessed. And remember, we talked about how Paul allegorized that and said, actually, the, the descendant that God was promising was Jesus. And, and the, a good question to ask is, well, why didn't God send Jesus right away? And that's a question that we can't get into. But in, this, in the New Testament, it says, at the right time, God sent Jesus. But in the, media, in the meantime, in this mediary time, the loss, uh, the top bullet point here says, it served as a guard until Jesus but, but a lot of times when I've read that, you know, years back, I think, oh, yeah, like a, like, like a bodyguard. He's, it's there to protect me. But we see it wasn't, the, the law wasn't a benevolent bodyguard. It actually imprisoned us. And the Apostle Paul says the law, this guard, stood actually outside the jail cell and kept us inside the prison. And there's that little picture I had of the prison guard. It's the, this is not a good thing because... It imprisons us to sin. The law actually made sin us made us sin and made us sin more. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans in chapter seven. We wouldn't even know what sin was unless the unless the law said, "Hey, don't don't commit adultery, don't murder." And now that we know, oh, I shouldn't sleep with other people, even though I'm married. Oh, I, I shouldn't murder. I shouldn't lie. Now, when we try and actually do that, we can't do it. And so, with the giving of the law. It just gets worse. It becomes, as the Apostle Paul put it, exceedingly sinful, which is, it's really confusing. And then I love how the Apostle Paul wraps up this, this, uh, this teaching that he gives in, in Galatians 3. And I, and I just kind of mentioned this uh, at first. Uh, here's verse 19. Well, why, why then the law? Why did God give this law if it was all about Jesus? Well, it was added because of sins. Until the offspring, that's Jesus, until Jesus would be able to come, which is the promise had been made to Abraham. That's what the promise is all about. It's all about Jesus. And this law was put in place through angels by an intermediary. At least that's the tradition that there was angels involved when they, the law was given to Moses. And I was mentioning this to Greg Boyd in our SEM class this past Tuesday. I brought that point up. Okay, verse 20. Now, as an intermediary applies more than one, but God is one. Now, verse 21, is the law, this righteous good thing that we can't do, is it contrary to the promises of God? Well, no, because remember, it represents how good God is. But here's the key verse that we're going to start with today and go on. If a law could have been given that could give life, then righteousness would have indeed come by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. Remember, that's, that's the prison, the guard standing and keeping us in the jail cell, so that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given to all those who believe. So the law, the problem with the law is it didn't give life, or another way of putting it, it didn't give human beings any power to do what the law required. We're powerless to do it. And that's why the, I wrote in this very last sentence on the bottom of the slides is, what I don't want to do I do, right? The Apostle Paul writes that in chapter seven, that confusing part where it says, you know, I do what I don't want to do and what I want to do, I don't do. And it, it's confusing to, to try and read that. But what he's basically saying is the law comes 
And I, and I, I, and I can look and say, I agree. This is good. I don't want anyone to murder me, you know, murder me. I don't want anyone to lie to me. I don't want anyone to cheat on me. I don't want anyone to, you know, be disobedient to me. If, I, if I'm a parent to a child, like I can agree it's good, but then when I actually try and go out and do it, I can't do it. In fact, what happens instead, I end up doing what I shouldn't do even the more. And so giving the law to human beings, yes, it sets the bar and says, here's, here, here's what to be life-giving is, but there's no power to do it. So that's why the Apostle Paul says, if a law, if a precept, if, if a rule could have been given that says, all right, Vinny, here's a rule, and by the way, I'm going to give you the power to do it. Like, for example, I need the law in mode. Okay, thank you for telling me that, God. And But then he says, and actually, here's a lawnmower to help you do it. Well, that's perfect. But all God did in giving the law says, hey, I need the lawn mode, but there's no power to do it. Now, hopefully that, that's a, probably a stupid analogy, but it, just trying to give, that's setting the stage for what we covered last time as a review. And now we're, we're setting the stage for what we're going on today. So this is part two of being set free from the law. And this is turning a completely spin around. Uh, we're, we're spinning this idea we've been traditionally taught. And unfortunately, this gets taught a certain way because of we, we've been raised with this penal substitution view of God. And that the only reason that Jesus comes is to, to escape God's wrath and anger. And yes, we already talked about there's somewhat of a truth in that, in that there is a judgment coming, a uh, judgment of the living and the dead. There's going to be a resurrection. We, we don't, but what that exactly is going to look like, perhaps there, you know, there's some alternate views of that. But really, in the sense of being free from the law and being free from, from, from sin, um, I, I'm just contending and putting forth that it, this is a different concept entirely what we've been led to believe. And, and I, this is what we're going to go over uh, in this second part today. So Hebrews 7, verses 18 and 19, we'll just read that because I always like to go to the Word. I picked a different translation for this one. I usually just stick with the ESV, but... The old rule then is set aside, the old law, because it was weak and useless. What good does it do to tell a person the law needs to get mowed if you don't give them any tool to do it, to mow the law? For if the law of Moses, for the law of Moses could not make anything perfect. It couldn't perfect a person. But now a better hope has been provided through which we come near to God. The law is weak and it's useless in itself. And it can't bring us into perfection. It can't make us transformed into the image of God. It just shows us the image of God, but then it can't get us to that next level. All it does, it shows us how sinful we are and instructs us to go kill another animal, right? It just says, well, you sin. And what does the law say? Well, if, if that happened, you need to make atonement for your sin and you need to go sacrifice an animal. And again, I think we've got the wrong idea about that again, too. This idea of somehow the animal and, and the life going out of the blood of the animal, that is, is somehow atoning for our sin. But I raised this question when I went to Israel. We went into this um, shop right off one of the squares inside of Jerusalem, inside the Jerusalem walls. And I, and I, I thought it was, all, this is only back in 2019. Um, and I kind of, as you can tell, sometimes I, I think I know a lot. And so this is one of my weak moments where I thought I knew what was going on. And, and I just, this, this guy gave, this Jewish guy gave a lecture and he just went through every single thing about like how Christians come into his shop and just tell him, you know, you've got a blind over your eyes because you, you don't, you, a veil is over your eyes because you don't see um, the scriptures in the view of Christ and you've got all, you know, we need to evangelize you. And he just went through every single thing and just destroyed it. <laughs> I mean, let, he, he left no Christian with any argument. Um, uh, he could not be evangelized because he's, he's heard every single evangelism tactic and he had an answer. And they were really, really good Jewish answer uh, from a Jewish perspective and response. I was really impressed. And then he said, any questions? And the 35 of us that were there was all senior citizens except for me because I got grafted into this trip it was a beautiful opportunity. So far, thankful for it. And I, no, thinking I knew it all, I said, well, what about the sacrifices? And I said, you know, we're standing right next to the Western Wall here, or the Weeping Wall. I said, isn't it true that you guys are so primitive, you're going to go back to offering blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, if the temple's rebuilt? Isn't that true that when the temples are built, you guys are going to go back to doing that? And I'm trying to like, you know, prove that I'm like, that's so archaic. That just seems so wrong. You know, like 
because you need your sins forgiven? How are you going to make atonement? <clears throat> and I, I, I'll never forget it. He looked at me, his response. He looked at me as if I had no clue what I was talking about because I didn't. He goes, he goes, of course, we're going to do sacrifices because when we offer sacrifices at the altar, we're not trying to get forgiveness of sins. We're just sharing a meal with God. That's all it is. We're sharing a meal and going back into the presence of God to be restored. And I'm like, what? That's not what I was taught as a Christian. I was taught that these animal sacrifices are supposed to somehow make atonement. And, they, and, he, and he's like, no, that, that, that's intimacy with God. And so if you think of it in that sense, that when, the, when we break the law, the idea was supposed to be we go offer animal sacrifice. It was to go back in communion with God and be in his presence and share a meal, an intimate meal. <laughs> so I just love that version. If we, if we see some of the, um, the rituals that God commanded the Israelites, Perhaps this Jewish guy was right that really it's it's to, it's to spend time with God. That's the to be intimate with God and be back in fellowship with Him, because if we're sinning, we're we're probably out of His fellowship. That was a long rabbit trail, but that's what the law basically taught us to do. Oh, if we if we sin, we better go kill another animal. Better go offer a sacrifice, because that's all we could do. It was le uh, the law was weak in curbing our sin, and here's what Paul said, uh, Romans seven. I've referred to this. Did that which is good, he's talking about the law, it, did the law, which is good, then bring death to me? Well, no, it wasn't the law. It wasn't God's goodness. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. It just showed us that sin dwelled inside of us. And that sin is the thing that brought death, not, not the goodness of God's law. And why? In order that sin might be shown to be sin. That's what the law's purpose. It helped us realize what sin is. And through the commandments might even become beyond sin, sinful, beyond measure. So sin got even greater and bigger. And here is the crux of the verse too. Just like there was a crux of the passage from Galatians. Remember the Galatians passage said, if the law could bring life, um, or, or sorry, um, from that last section, I just want to look at it again because it was good. For if a law had been given that could give life, then, hey, the law would have been a great thing, but it didn't give life. And here's how the Apostle Paul finishes up this verse, this passage in Romans 7. He says, for we know the law is spiritual. That's the key point. Pneuma, the spirit, word for spirit in the New Testament. We know the law is spiritual, but I'm merely flesh, sold under sin. Just got to take a, a sail on moment there. And so I put at the bottom of the slide, what do you mean spiritual? The law, spiritual? Well, here's what I think this is what it means. The law, spiritual, means that it emanates from the spiritual realm of God. God's goodness, these precepts he sets forward as how to treat your neighbor as yourself, it emanates from his literal spiritual realm. The law then equals God's and we're talking about these the, the, the right living with one another in society and being self-sacrificial. The law means God's self-sacrificial love in action on earth. That's what it means. It's spiritual. It's literally God's love in action. That's what the law is. But as the rest of the sentence goes on, it says, uh, it can, uh, as the rest of the sentence goes on to say, it can only be walked out because it's spiritual. It can only be walked out and accomplished via the spiritual life that God imparts and gives to others. I'm going to say that again. So the law is God's self-sacrificial love and action on earth. It's God in action. That's what the law is. And it can only be walked out and accomplished or lived out via the spiritual life that God imparts and gives to others. And this is why, the next sentence, the giving of the law to the Israelites it did not impart the life of God or the ability of God or the spiritual nature of the law it was not given to the people. The giving of law didn't equip anyone to keep it. That's why it was weak. And I, I, I put here the mirror and shaving analogy. I kind of use the same analogy with the lawnmower thing. But if I gave George a mirror and said, George, dude, you got to shave. Take a look. Take a look at yourself in the mirror. And then George goes, oh man, I do need to shave. My mustache ain't, you know, up to par. And, and I, I got some other, I got a goatee kind of form or whatever. 
That'd be great. That'd be the proper usage of the mirror. But if George were to take the mirror and try and shave with the mirror, I'd be sitting there with my hands on my head going, George, come on, man, you're a scientist. What are you doing? That's not going to shave. You need a shaver. Okay. That's exactly what the law, the law was a mirror to show us our issues, but then we can't use the law to actually accomplish what we need done. We needed, we needed something, we needed life inside of us to get the actions of the law out. So the law is spiritual. If that's the case, we need a spiritual answer to sin. We just can't take a fleshly approach. That's what Paul said. I'm only flesh. I'm, I'm merely flesh. How can I, how can I keep the, and do what's in the law if the law is spiritual? It represents the spiritual nature of God. So the answer to the problem of sin, last paragraph here, is not going to be in just knowing what sin is or, or by God given the law or not, or not just trying to you know, stop yourself from sinning by keeping the law. That's not the answer. But we need a spiritual answer, which is what I underline here. It's in filling the person's heart with the spiritual nature of God's love so that we can organically, by nature, do what's in the law. That's the freedom from sin. And if think of it in that context, when we look back, this is one of the, one of the first third or fourth slide we started with six weeks ago. How Jesus sets us free from sin is not merely wiping away the eternal punishment for sin, but he provides the spiritual answer to the law to free us from sinning by imparting spiritual life into us through the new birth. And that's what we covered two weeks ago, all about the new birth. He frees us from the law by giving us the antidote for sin, which is a new nature. You're born from above, born again. Because listen to how Jesus says this. John chapter 8, 31, 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered, well, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. We're not slaves. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered to them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave doesn't remain in the household forever. The son remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Notice there's nothing there about penal substitution or something about God's got this thing, this, this anger he's got to somehow release somewhere. He's saying, listen, the problem is that sin is in the earth. We need to get rid of sin. And so I will set you free because, or I will set you free and being set free means you will no longer be practicing the sin. Because even if you're, got righteousness with God. This is what we covered in the Holy Spirit class a while back. You might be right with God. Abraham was right with God, right? It says in, in uh, Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God concerning these promises, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't have the law. He wasn't even circumcised, but he was right with God. He had a righteousness with God, but yet he still had sin in his life. He, he, wasn't, he was still a slave to sin. So this is the freedom that Jesus is, is, is offering and, and how I, I see this. So to be set free from the law, to get back to our module tonight, then it takes on a whole new meaning in this context. While it is a fact that we do have 100% total freedom from any guilt or any condemnation with God, if we don't keep the law perfectly, that's what we covered in the first uh, four weeks there, so the three weeks, We've got, we don't even have to worry about God. He's, he loves us. He sees us in Christ. And even before we're in Christ, man, we, we are free from guilt and condemnation as far as his uh, respect towards us, relation with us. That's true. But the true freedom that Jesus is offering is, is via the new birth and having this power to overcome sin and act in perfect love just like him. It's this new birth that's the life that we need so we are no longer, Mr. O there, no longer slaves to sin. As I mentioned, if, you're, if we're still caught in the sin, we're still slaves to it, even though we might be righteous. And I believe this is the freedom that Jesus is talking about. Jesus' incarnation, here I'm going to kind of prove it. Um, Jesus' incarnation embodied this freedom. So we've covered a lot of Romans 
um, especially chapter seven, talking about how the law was the knowledge of sin and it it was the um, means by which we came to know what sin is, but but yet because we didn't have the power, um, unfortunately, it made the sin even worse. And it made us cry out to God as the last verse of that uh, passage, cha uh, chapter seven says, oh, oh, wretched man, you know, um, who's going to save me from this? Um, so we've covered all that, but now everything changes in Romans 8. And if you've ever looked at the book of Romans 8, is kind of like the whole switch where, 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 where the Apostle Paul brings this, this the beautiful nature of being in Christ, being in the Spirit, and now the victory that we have in this. And we started with this exact slide on that first week as well. Now we're going to look at it from in the context of everything we've covered up from these weeks. Now in the context of the law here, because the law is all over the place in the book of Romans, and it comes up again in, in our victory over it. So listen to how Jesus had freedom um, from sins in respect to the law. Listen to this. In context now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life now, remember, pneuma, spirit, can be capital S or lowercase s. The only way to know whether it's lowercase s or uppercase s is by the context. And I would make it, I would argue that based on the context, what the Apostle Paul is saying, it's talking about lowercase s. It's talking about being in the spirit. It's talking about a positional truth. We are in Christ Jesus. Now, the law of the spirit of life, this life that God has impregnated you with, this life that's in you now because you're in Christ, now, yes, it can be partly with the Holy Spirit, but let's not forget the, 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 the born-again nature that we have. Listen, it has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. Okay, we're set free from the law. That's, that's what this whole module is about. Notice how, though, for God has done, he accomplished what the law, because the law is weakened by flesh. We covered that. You have no power in the flesh. He has accomplished it. Um, let me read that again. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The law could not do it in itself. How did he do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. Now, how did he condemn it? He said, well, you're not under the law anymore? No. Look, this is what it says. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So that it means so that way we can actually do what the law says. We can fulfill the requirement of the law. That's the freedom. That's being set free from the law. We're set free with the ability to be to fulfill it. Who walk not according to the flesh, because in the flesh you can't do it. If you're walking in the flesh, you're only considering regarding yourself as just a human being. You're not regarding the new nature. You're not regarding this new birth. You're going to have no power to do it. But for those who walk according to the Spirit, that's where the life is, because God has put that life in your spirit. That's amazing. Christ fr got free from the law, not, not by just saying, well, the law is no good, and I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to just willy-nilly and get the law. No, not one tittle of the law, not one little bit of it was going to pass away. Jesus fulfilled the law because why? And we talked about that uh, when we did the Born Again New Nature, um, that, that module, that when Jesus was born, even before he had the indwelling Holy Spirit, at least we see at the River Jordan when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit fell like a dove, he still had this new nature in him. He was, he was as if he was a human being, but yet he was empowered with spiritual life in his human spirit. And that's what enabled him to get free from sin. He lived a life that did not have sin. And you could say, well, that's because he was God. But we know that he laid down his divinity, his divinity, and he became a man just like us. Yeah, he was God, but every attribute of being uh, divine, he laid that down and didn't use his power as a, as a means to try and, you know, ex exploit it. In fact, he acted just like a man in the same way and gave us an example to live after. And so this is how Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it by fulfilling the requirement of it. And then he says in the same way, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in who? In us. So we can also live this same life free from sin 
but not if we walk according to the flesh, but walking according to the Spirit. Go back a few chapters, and, and the Apostle Paul says, God's love has been poured into our hearts, and the King James says, shut abroad. It's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit sheds the love into our hearts. It's not only that the Holy Spirit is the, is the thing that's the love. He sheds it into our hearts so it becomes embedded into our very nature. And that, I believe, is the new birth. It's, 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 it's putting it into our hearts, which is just another word for our inner being. Everything we need to overcome sin has been now deposited in seed form in our new nature, in our new spiritual nature. Because we didn't have a spiritual nature before this. We were spiritually dead. This is now where God's love is residing. Our once dead human spirit has now received the same life that Jesus' human spirit had when he walked on the earth. And it's my opinion that that is what compelled and enabled him to walk out the law perfectly. It's this love shed in our hearts, that's the spiritual thing. It's literally God's love in us. Because remember, God's law is his love. It's literally his love in action on earth. That's what the law is. And so God sheds that same love in our hearts and puts that spiritual nature in us. And this is the only way we can walk out the righteousness of the law. It's the only way we're going to be able to get power over our the things that hold us back. And we now have that life within us that just the plain giving of the law didn't do. It, it just gave us the knowledge of sin. Now that life is in us. So another couple, another little pictures I like to use. And I, and I want to take some other scriptures uh, from the New Testament the Apostle Paul um, has written. And I'm going to put these in a light that maybe you haven't seen before and kind of put these scriptures uh, all together in the context of freedom from sin. So I know I'm going through a lot here, but just hang with me. So here's Colossians 2, chapter 12 and 13. It says, mid, mid thought, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him. So it's saying you once were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. We always have been taught, at least I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making generalizations. Me, that meant you're, you're dead, meaning that you're going to hell. You're dead in your trespasses, okay? But God made you alive with him, meaning now you're not going to hell. But I think what he's talking about here is you are dead in your trespasses, dead in your trespasses like you had no life to overcome sin. You were impregnated. I'm sorry. You, 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 um, so the uncircumcision of your flesh means you had a hard heart. On the inward part of your being, it was still hard and stiff. It, it was uncircumcised. It didn't have the life of God in it. That's what I believe he's talking about. You're dead. You had like dead like a dead battery. Okay. But being made alive in Christ means you were impregnated with power over sins. Now you are alive. You once were dead, had just like a battery. You turn the key and there's nothing there. You have no ability to get the car started. But being made alive in Christ, now, boy, you got a battery. You got some juice in there, boy. You can get this thing going. And and maybe, yeah, you, you're, you know, you've got some old residual crap in you. And so you're like an old carburetor where you got to hit the gas. You know, don't flood the engine. You got to, you know, got to work with it. But you'll get that car started. Praise God, you got all, everything you need. Maybe you need a little overhaul, but that battery's not dead anymore. And just because your battery is dead doesn't mean the vehicle's worthless or condemned. That's what we always think. Oh, we're dead. We're just terrible. No, you just need a new battery. That's all. And so this first bullet part, our conscious has been sprinkled with the blood of Christ. So we, we have full assurance. Our hearts are assured um, that we are one with God and he has no judgment or, or condemnation towards us. And we needed Christ's love displayed on the cross. We needed that to happen. Because our sins always tell us otherwise. They always tell us, man, I, I, I followed short again. God must hate me. Oh, I'm just, I, I did something bad again. Oh, uh, you know, God can't be with me. So, but, but now we have this picture of God, Christ on the cross that says, you know what? You have so much value. It's unsurpassable worth. That's our visual picture, the proof that tells us no matter 
and this is what the Old Testament didn't have. The Old Testament saints did not have this revelation of God's love. They didn't have the picture. They didn't have God coming to earth to show indisputably the amount of love and care and worth and value that he has for us. Okay, that is what I believe the cross shows us. But now that we know that truth, bullet point two, that does set our minds free in Christ. But now the new birth has become the power source that has made us alive in Christ. Alive meaning now we have this battery charged or it's been replaced, however you want to look at that. It brings now life to this vehicle, this automobile. You, you now have the life to do it because even knowing that God loves us, yeah, that might set you free from some things, but we still need that power to accomplish this out. That's how I see being dead in sins and alive in Christ. That's how I'm seeing this now in a different light. I never saw this until just a few years ago. Here's another example. is Ephesians 2, 1, uh, 1 through 6. Here, the same analogies are made. You were once dead in the trespasses and sins. Now think of that in the context of dead. and You had no life to get free from them. You had no life to get out and out from underneath them. In which you once walked when you followed the course of this world, when you were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at now work in the sons of disobedience, among who we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, because that's all we had, flesh. We didn't have anything else in our bodies, just flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature. See, by nature, you, you have nothing else but flesh. By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and unable to get free from our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. Gave us a new nature. That's what I think that means. He made us alive together. He gave us a new spiritual nature. That nature is now inside of us and it brings life to us. We're alive because the life of God has been put in us. And yes, the Holy Spirit's in there too to help remind us and be our teacher and, and cultivate this new life in us. But there is a life inside of us that is transcendent beyond the Holy Spirit. This is a new birth. And I'm going to take this even further. And, and uh, the second part, and by grace you have been saved, raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. I mentioned that verse at our last worship night. This is why I've been meditating on this verse for a couple of years now. So point one, I'll get, to, I'll get to that last half of that verse. Point one, we're no longer children of wrath by nature. Our nature has been changed. Remember, the law is spiritual, but I was only flesh sold under sin. But now in the new birth, being in Christ, positionally, we are positioning in Christ because we have this new birth. By nature, we're not children of wrath. We have the love of God spread abroad in our hearts, who has now changed us fundamentally who we are. We've been given the same nature that's created after the same image of God in true righteousness and holiness. We're no longer the same person we were. And so our, we have been made alive in Christ. Now we have to take this by faith as we talked about it. When we go to the dentist's office and they, you know, put that radiation thing on you to, to or whatever, the x-ray, you know, we don't know anything's happened. We just think we just sat in that little dentist chair and nothing happened. But we know something happened because they put the screen up on and you can see your x-rays and you can see your teeth. Hmm. I didn't feel anything. Are you sure anything happened? Well, yeah, I can see the screen and I can see my teeth. So something must, even though my five senses didn't discern it, I may not have had a goosebump when I got born again. And I may not have fell to my knees and bawled my eyes out. And, and maybe I didn't get this, you know, happy uh, 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 feeling of euphoria going down the back of your spine. Believe me, if you become a believer in Jesus, you've been born again and you have this new nature living in you. And the word of God or the story of God that we find between the two Testaments, this is our mirror that tells us who we are. And we use that as our measurement. We don't do any other thing. And anything that comes against that, we pull those thoughts down and bring them into the conformity of who Christ is and who we are in that nature. Period. That's a mic drop moment. But the second part, it says, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. Saved from what? Again, I, when I was in the Baptist church, we're well, saved from God's wrath, saved from, saved from Gordon from to hell. Well, if we take our penal substitution glasses off, remember how we started this class, the very first slide, uh, one of the first slides, we looked at when, when the angel appeared to Joseph and, and uh, 
or I'm sorry, Mary, and said, you know, you're going to conceive a son. How's this going to be? Well, the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you, and the power of the Almighty is going to overpower you. And, you know, you're going to bore a son. His name is going to be Jesus. And he, right here, shall, um, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We've been saved. We've been made alive together to get, a, to get us free from this um, children of wrath. That's what has changed. Is we're no longer enemies of God doing things that are completely against his nature and against what he wants us to be as life givers and light givers in this world. He's, he's saved us from being dead, from having a dead power source to now being alive. That's what I think we're being saved from. That, that, this is just great. This, this opens up the whole New Testament in ways that scriptures I used to have a hard time with. I'm like, I don't know about now. I'm just embracing. These are just the greatest scriptures of all time. This just empowers me to be like, my God, is this true? Because if this, if this is really true, I have no real reason to be stuck in crap anymore. I can actually get through free from this stuff. And it takes community too, and it takes cultivation. But I can, I can get over this stuff. I no longer have to take the attitude of, I'm just going to be the way I am the rest of my life. This is powerful stuff. Next slide, Romans 6. I'm going to keep going with the Apostle Paul and try and bring this into this context. Here's, here's again what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to, to continue in sin that God's grace towards us may abound? Remember, God has always been gracious to us in our sins. He's never, ever treated us according to, to what we deserve. And if that's the case, if God just forgives us, well, well, should we just keep, I mean, just big deal then, right? I'm, 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 I'm good to go. I mean, God's forgiveness is always there for me. But then Paul says, well, no, of course not. By knowing that's not how we should be living. How can we who died to sin, that part of us that was the sin generator, the part of us that, that made us sin, which is unconnected to God, if we've died to that part of us, why would we want to still live in it? Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? There is something inside of us that died. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. For what purpose? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like his, if that's the case, if we have been united with him in a death, we certainly shall be united with him in a resurrection like this, in his, like his, sorry. We should be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 6, we know that our old self, that old nature, that nature that was contrary to God, that we just looked in, in, in Ephesians, that old part of us was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we'd no longer be enslaved to sin. For, the, for one who has died has been set free from sin. So what is death? What is this? Our state of death is a spiritually dead existence. That's what death is. You were, you were once dead. You didn't have any spiritual life inside of you. That condition of being spiritually dead has died. The condition of being spiritually dead has been crucified. The condition of being spiritually dead, your old self, the old self was spiritually dead, has died with Christ. It no longer exists. That's what I think this is meaning. We have been now imbued with life, and anything that does not resemble life or the life of God it's, that's just a remnant in our flesh that has not yet been conformed to the new nature that we are. That's okay. We're going to still have crap that we haven't got fully um, under the control of the spirit, the spirit nature of us. And God knows that. There's grace. There's always been grace. But now we have the power to get free from this stuff. And we have been set free. So I'm just saying, let's agree with the truth of what God has done in Christ through the new birth so that the Holy Spirit can be invited in to transform us to who we really are. And that's one of the things I brought up in the last session is if we don't give the Holy Spirit to work with, anything to work with, if we just say, well, I am what I am. Thank God I'm saved and I'm not going to go to hell. Well, good deal. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He or she, however you want to think of her, um, it, it's not going to be able to do any work because it doesn't force itself on you. We have to be in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I tell you what, I lived a lot of my life not in any partnership with the Holy Spirit at all. I'm just thinking, I'm just doing what I'm doing, and at least I got grace, and uh, I'm good. 
I wasn't given the Holy Spirit anything to work with, so I just stayed the same spot that I was in, in many parts of my life. So this has really transformed some stuff. I tried to make some some <clears throat> some pictures. We're getting to the end here of um, this segment. Because uh, as I was putting this entire six-week uh, course together and presentation, I really felt the Lord impressing on me that pictures sometimes help explain the many, many words that I say, because I get so excited, and the many, many verses. But imagine this, this little guy with a frowny face. Um, it, it's, it's Technically, he's supposed to be holding a sign, but I, I kind of, I imagine this as he's holding up like a magnifying glass to what's on the inside of him. Okay. Inside of us, the Apostle Paul is basically saying there's a generator. Okay. And, and, and inside of, of, of human beings, just by default, not at any fault of our own, but just having a nature of just being human, your human spirit is without God. It doesn't have the nature of God inside of it. There's no spiritual nature of it. That's God's spirit. It doesn't have him living in us. Right. So there, it's a sin generator. It's, it's grown corrupt. It's selfish. It's fearful. It has shame. And I put a little poof of smoke coming from it. It's broken. The generator that's supposed to bring life to us, there's something in us that's not functioning right. And for some reason, all of us have it. In fact, that's what the uh, book of Romans chapter 5 makes a case saying, sin has reigned from Adam all the way till now. Um, and, and actually, like in the uh, classic uh, Catholic tradition and even some evangelical hardcore conservative tradition, they believe that the sin nature, the the the, the, the propensity to, to be sinful was actually carried like Augustine, uh, one of the early church fathers of the fourth, fifth century, um, fourth and fifth, I think just the fourth, but I can't remember how long he lived. Maybe he lived into the 400s, but believe it transferred through the male sperm. So there's something in the sperm that actually transmits Adam's sinful nature, and that's how it's transmitted. Um, now, I don't necessarily hold to that theory, but I'm just saying that because that's how it was viewed back in the old days. Bef you know, that's, of course, way before the scientific method and way before we had the, the enlightenment and thinking things outside the kind of box of uh, just kind of how they thought him. But this is how the Apostle Paul is framing it, saying, like, listen, you're only... Um, you know, I know the law is spiritual, Romans seven fourteen, but I'm um, sold under the. I'm only flesh, sold under sin. This is what he's saying: that you're dead in your trespasses and sin. You don't have anything in you that can generate life, that can generate um, God's goodness that He wants us to be. Rather, instead of what happens, we generate uh, selfishness and corruption and licentiousness and all those big terms that the Apostle Paul uses and and corruption and 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 we're and we just do mean things to people at our own expense we're not selfless all we care about is ourself that's because something fundamentally on the inside of us isn't tweaked right and maybe you can instill um what, what i've come to a terminology of a synthetic conscious because you can say well, well well i don't know can't you beat it into people and, and make make people fearful well yeah that's exactly what the law has done to people we we think you just come to Jesus and God's going to save your sins so you don't go to hell. And then he gives you the Holy Spirit to kind of help you live a good life. And then we try and live this out and we still fall short. And then we, well, God, you know, if you don't live holy, God's got something against you. You know, your sin, your prayers aren't going to get to the roof. You got sin in your life. You better get rid of that sin. Get rid of that sin. And we're so afraid of God. We have this mental picture that God's going to hurt us and he's angry with us and he can't stand to be around sin. And so even though I'm a Christian and I sin, then I, I can't even go to prayer anymore and I feel condemned. And so then I don't even talk to God. So I might as well just get high and, and, and just drink a bunch of beer, whatever it might be, whatever thing, or I might just veg out on Netflix instead of, because I can't spend time with God. That's our view of what we've made it, that, we're, that we don't have any power over this stuff. And it just, and it just gets the goat because there's no power in that either. Um, but let me just move to the next slide. I kind of went on a rabbit trail there. Um, the next slide kind of shows how I believe the Apostle Paul is framing this. What he's saying is that now something has happened inside of us. Here's a little guy holding a magnifying glass of what's happened. In our heart, you see the little Holy Spirit of Dove. He has entered into our heart and he has brought the life of Christ like a mailman and administered that. And he took the love of God and poof, 
shut it abroad in our heart in seed form. That, that sin generator, that thing that caused us to sin, which might just be the lack of God's presence. It might be the lack of having a spiritual nature, the lack of having God's life in us. That part has been crucified as it died. And we've received this new renewed human spirit. And yes, it grows into maturity. And it's selfless because it's just like God. It always has others oriented um, their uh, beneficial um, endeavors in mind before your own. It doesn't have any fear and it doesn't have any shame. And it's created just like God. It's the, as we read from, uh, or as I quoted from Ephesians 4, it's, it's made in true righteousness and true holiness. And it's got the same nature as Jesus. It's the same righteousness. It's the same thing what we read in Romans 8, where um, God condemned sin in the flesh by sending Jesus in the likeness of human flesh to condemn sin so that the righteousness requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. So that way, the good stuff in the law, now can actually we can actually live it out because something inside of us has changed. So that's, that's how I see the Apostle Paul kind of explain this. And the visualization for me really helped. Hopefully that helps you. So the last two slides I think I have here is God's charge to us is now to walk in the truth of this new nature as this new nature being the antidote to break free from sins so that the righteous goodness of God's law, which is just a law of love, that's how it was the Apostle Paul later put, puts it as, there's, there's, there's nothing against the law of love, might be fulfilled in us. And here's two verses that have been key verses for my life because I always thought that I can't come to God unless I'm sinless or unless I'm doing a much better job. And so, and the only way that I could find power to do that was to white knuckle things. And you might be able to get by for a while, but if you have a nature in you that's predispositioned, that's at enmity with God, eventually white knuckling, you're just either going to wear out, you're going to get exhausted or be caught one day with your pants down and you don't have your guard up or whatever. And, and so that meant for me as a teenager, I could never come into full fellowship with God because I just, my sins condemned me. And then I saw the cross, I saw the love of God, and I came to Christ. And I, I never doubted his love because I saw that manifest towards me, what he did on the cross. Uh, yes, unsurpassable worth, but then I still felt like I could not get free. And I still thought I had the white knuckle things. But then these two verses, I came across these when I went to Bible college in my 20s. And it really broke open a whole different way of getting free from the things that bring death to me and brings death to others. Here's Galatians 5, 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. These two are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Isn't it cool how it keeps bringing the law into this? It's, these, it's just like it comes full circle. Um, and notice I also put, the, the I took Gordon Fee, a great theologian who died a few years ago, who said the same thing I was saying, that you can't really translate pneuma, spirit, lowercase s or uppercase s. It doesn't exist in the, in the Greek. It's unical. It's either all capitals or all lowercase letters. So the translator has to decide whether it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Is it talking about the human spirit? Is it talking about spirit just in the general sense of like uh, having class spirit or, or smells like teen spirit? <laughs> or um, is it talking about a positional sense of spirit? But I put both. Um, so the Apostle Paul is saying by walking in the spirit, whether you're believing that's in the Holy Spirit or in your human spirit, or I think both, that is the key to not gratifying the desires of the flesh. That's, the, that's the, 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 the key that unlocks the door. It's being in tune with, walking in, practicing, being aware of, um, whatever means necessary to be in the spirit. That's the way. It's not white knuckling. It's not trying to not do something. That's not going to get you too far. Although some people have a really strong willpower, my dad was one of those guys, um, he, just, he just has that willpower, he can just do things, but for people like me, that doesn't work, 
I need, I need something better than willpower. He echoes the same thing in the book of Romans, um, chapter 8, 9 through 13. You are not in the flesh anymore. You're not just a human being with molecules and matters, but you now you're in the spirit, the positional sense of in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, you are not his. And if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. You've been impregnated with this new life inside of you. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Man, you're going to have life now. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to live or to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. If you're going to white knuckle, you're going to die. Or if you just view yourself as just a, a person who's flesh with the Holy Spirit living in you only, but you're still just in the flesh, you're still just Vinny who's saved from going to hell, but yet you don't, but your nature hasn't changed, you're going to die. It's, it, you're gonna, there's no life in that. But if by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. By the spiritual realm, the, 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 the being in the nature of the spirit, uh, having that in your human spirit, or being in the positional state of being in the spirit. For as many are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the answer, I believe, the Apostle Paul is leading up to is, is, is first recognizing that we have been transformed through the new birth, and then practicing that, walking that out in our minds. And we talk a lot about that at Woodland Hills about how do you, how you view, you know, how you view God is probably the most important thing. But secondary, what I would argue for is how you view yourself. So yes, we need to have our imaginations, imagining God for being who he is as Jesus Christ. That is our number one example. But we need to also take some time to imagine who we are and to see ourselves as being transformed, to see ourselves imbued with this new nature because that's walking in the Spirit. That's walking in the truth of the Spirit and using whatever means necessary to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit doesn't mean to say, oh, I'm a terrible person. I just, I can't believe I did that. No, that's walking in the flesh. Walk in the Spirit says, you know what? I don't care what's going on in my life because eventually it's going to turn loose. Whatever is going on in my life, no matter what stronghold, the Bible says and Jesus says and my new nature says that I am going to get set free. So even if I'm not set free now, I can worship me with God right now because eventually it's going to happen. It's eventually going to break loose. Something's going to take loose and I don't have to worry. I don't have to condemn any part of myself. Hallelujah. I'm loved by the Father and eventually I'm going to be able to walk this thing out. And I can go into some deep exegesis on this verse. I'm really tempted to do so, but I'll just pass because I want to leave some time for discussion and maybe share a little about myself. I already did this when I reviewed this earlier tonight by myself and I had way too much fun, I was laughing and giggling. So we'll just move on to the last slide. Um, and think in everything that I've said, put it in this context. We're going to look at some verses, a passage from Matthew and, and think about it in this context. I'm not saying this is the only way to look at it, but it certainly sheds a different light on these passages. I'll be the first one to say, we're still going to fall short of God's glory until we die because we're never going to be fully conformed to his image until we, you know, are at the resurrection. I agree with that. That's kind of how we started this class, as um, I think Richard brought that up as a very first question. I'm not saying that. However, we don't need to carry any condemnation or guilt for that. That that we've already established that through the rest of these classes, that God already sees us in Christ. He just sees us as a work in progress. We're just a construction project. We could take little signs and hang around our neck that say, pardon the mess, I'm a work in progress, and God loves us despite anything. We have, we're fully in his presence. We're fully good. It's okay. However, knowing our potential with a new birth, it seems as though Jesus sets a pretty high bar of expectation because he knows our potential. We are his image bearers being sent out, just like Jesus in his image, to represent the perfect love of the Father. If you were a teacher and you had it taught mathematics maybe and you saw a kid who's got all kinds of problems in his life but you saw that this guy this inside of him he has the potential to be a great mathematician maybe one of the most 
you would do everything in your power to encourage him to reach that potential. And that's how God sees us. He's not condemning us saying, you need to live up to this standard. He's saying, my God, do you have any idea of the potential that's in you to be a light giver to me and to the world? Do you have any idea how much good you can bring to this world? How much crap you can turn around? All this crap that Satan has done is where do you even recognize yet what I've put inside of you in this new birth? And, and, the, and the power of the Holy Ghost living in the side of you to, 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 to teach you about this and to go out in the power, if you have any... So he, that's, I believe, in my opinion, that's how Jesus is seeing us. He's just trying to develop what we have. There's no condemnation in him. He's not condemning us if we fall short. He's the, he's the one picking us up when the football player gets knocked down. He's, 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 God's the one extending his arm going, come on, I got you. I know we, we're going to do this. He's never condemning. But listen to how he sets the, the higher bar. Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. It's you. A city set on a hill can't be hidden, nor people light a lamp and put a basket or put it under a basket. But you put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. That's the potential we have. In the same way, let this light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. And remember, if we go back to uh, John, the Gospel of John, and I can't help but do this, I'm just tempted. These first four verses we covered as well during the new birth. But in the beginning, the word, oh, here's a new version, the good news version, already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. Talking about, this is talking about Jesus, but actually the son of God is a better way of saying it because Jesus was his name when he was incarnate on earth. Jesus existed before um, he became on earth. So he was, in this example, he was the logos or logos, the word, the son was with God. This is talking about Jesus' deity when he was with God, fellowshipping with God, this perichoresis in heaven where they're all just inside one of another, fellowshipping in love with one another. Verse 2, from the beginning, the Word, the Son, was with God. And through him, the Father made all things. And that one thing in creation was made without him. That's all about Jesus' deity. deity. But then in verse 4, it switches to his humanity. When he was on earth, the Word was the source of life. And it's this life, the life of Jesus, the life that Jesus imparts to you when you get born again in your human spirit, that life brought light to people. That's the light that I believe Jesus is talking about here. And to wrap that up, here's how it, Jesus closes this chapter 5. You've heard that it says, he's talking about the law. We're talking about the law here. In the law, it says, you shall love thy neighbor and hate your enemy. It actually says that in the law. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Holy cow, that's in, how do you do that? Pray for the people that are your enemies? What? For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same thing? And if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than other people? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? And this verse is crazy, the last one. So he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. No, we're not going to be perfect in this life. We're, we're, we're a work in progress. We're an onion that has continual, almost seems like everlasting layers. However, God is saying, man, you're the light of the world. You have been given everything you need, and I want to develop that in you. He is the developer to the max. My wife says she's a developer. That's one of the things she loves about being around people is developing people. She doesn't have an expectation that they're going to be perfect. She's never put that expectation on me. But she knows the potential that I have and other people have. And when she sees that potential, she has so much love towards people. And she gets such a buzz and such a rush off of seeing people be developed. 
And that's how God sees us. He's saying, listen, you have been given a perfect nature, a sinless nature. I've given that to you as a gift. And now you can do the same thing I did. You can love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You're going to stumble. You're not going to get it right. But you are going to overcome. And he who stands firm in the end, man, he is going to be an overcomer. And for me, when I read this passage, therefore you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, that is not anything possible we can do in our flesh. That's just not the, what he's talking about is, is a spiritual ability to walk in the same love that God has. And he's put that inside of us. So my encouragement for all of us is to set the bar a little higher. Whatever things you might have in our lives that are causing junk, whether that be individually or whether that be systemically, corporately, wherever we see that, we have a ability, I think, to rise above anything that's coming against us in our lives. And that's just the way I wanted to end this as a, uh, just an exhortation in the same way that Jesus is exhorting us to allow the good nature that he has put in us to grow and to flourish, but it's not going to grow unless we believe it, unless we give the Holy Spirit something to work with. And in that, I believe that's what freedom from the law is. Freedom from the law is not just having a get out of uh, jail card for free or escape eternal punishment. That's how we're free from the law. We're free from the law by now we've been infused with the ability to actually keep it. And on that, I rest my case.